Hello everyone, I'm Cheyenne Town, Arizona Game and Fish Wildlife Viewing Program Coordinator. And today on Arizona Wildlife Views, we'll take a look at how drought is affecting biologists' efforts to conserve and protect the federally threatened Chiricahua leopard frog. Plus, a ride on the 675 mile Arizona Peace Trail, an OHV adventure in Western Arizona. And later, a day in the life of an Arizona Game and Fish biologist, keeping up with black-tailed prairie dogs in Southern Arizona. We've got all that and more today on Arizona Wildlife Views. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Living in Arizona, we all know just how precious water is here in our desert. Despite some monsoon storm activity this year, we're still a long way from being drought free. As you may know, game and fish biologists conserve and protect over 800 species of wildlife. Let's go take a look at how game fish is fighting drought to help the Chiricahua leopard frog. It's hard to imagine this lush landscape in Arizona's Apache Sitgreaves National Forest having any issues with drought. Drought is definitely an issue for, for our job as frog biologists. Cody Mosley and Audrey Owens are biologists for the Arizona Game and Fish Department, and one of their jobs is to conserve and protect Chiricahua leopard frogs. Oh, I see a frog. They're listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. The major threats include loss of habitat, disease, and invasive non-native predators like bullfrogs and crayfish. We've been in a drought for the last 20 plus years, which is, you know, just one more threat for the Chiricahua leopard frog. Our goal is to establish populations of these frogs um, out in the wild on the landscape. That means finding suitable habitat in which to relocate frogs from other wild populations or release those raised in captivity by conservation partners like the Phoenix Zoo. The outflow of this stock tank feeds into a creek where the biologists are looking for frogs. It's actually easier to survey at night because the frogs are more active at night. Cody did a release of frogs at this site in 2020. Um, and so we're trying to find out um, if we still have adult frogs here. But we're also looking for tadpoles tonight. That would be a sign that frogs have started to become established here um, if we're seeing successful breeding. Unfortunately, we are seeing crayfish. So we're removing them. They don't seem to be in high densities, but they're non-native, they're invasive, and they certainly can predate upon Chiricahua leopard frogs tadpoles and egg masses. So did you see the eye shine first? Nope, or just came around and saw the frog. Yes. The last survey I did in 2020, I would have bet money that we would not have found another frog. I was that concerned with the water level. Yeah, he was hanging up on that shore right there. And we haven't seen him in high numbers, but that's not a bad thing. We're just getting this population started. I'm hoping that, you know, after a couple releases, we can get a population established that will start dispersing. What we're working towards in Chiricahua Leopard Frog Conservation is getting metapopulations of frogs. And that's essentially a series of sites that are occupied, so kind of subpopulations across the landscape that are close enough in proximity to each other that frogs can move from one site to the next. Some sites rely on runoff from snow and rain. Others, like this stock tank, are fed by springs, making them more reliable sources of water. You know, during times of drought, 
some of those sites might dry and we might lose you know, a handful of those populations. But we have sites like this, you know, spring fed sites um, or sites that are maybe on a well. And so these sites are gonna have more permanent water. And so those are gonna be really important sites for the meta population as a whole. Several miles from here is another site that's about as good as it gets for frog habitat. It's a spring-fed stock tank with water flowing in and out. Audrey, I'm probably going to do a call playback over here as well. This habitat is free of non-native predators, and it's one of the first sites in this recovery area where biologists documented frogs surviving through multiple winters, a big deal in the White Mountains. Overwinter survival of frogs here just was the best. I mean, it was cloud nine. Better yet, this site had proven to be resilient to drought. 2018 was a really dry year, but this spring-fed stock tank continued to hold water. Then came 2020. Two years of extreme drought revealed a hard truth about these so-called permanent waters. We discovered that they can dry. <laughs> the water just kept dropping. Going into the, the summer of 2021, it was just bone dry. That was a significant blow to us. It's really reshaping the way that we think about um, habitat and the way that we think about, you know, what is permanent water. And so we need to be thinking differently. We need to be doing something different. One of the, the tools that we use against drought is habitat restoration. Like using methods to improve spring flow and cleaning sediment out of tanks so they'll hold more water. We did a project in a different recovery unit in 2018. This was a spring-fed site that um, had been a stronghold for Chiricahua leopard frogs through the 90s. And by 2017, 2018, the site was really not holding much water anymore because of erosion. Um, the channel had been sedimented in, and so we hired a spring specialist to come in and clean out that channel, creating um, pools through using a liner and also soil that was high in clay. So he created a groundwater dam just to kind of slow that water down and create pools. And the site filled with water immediately as soon as the monsoon hit that year. At this point, 2021, that site is an awesome Chiricahua leopard frog site. And it's a source population for the whole management area. Back at this spring-fed stock tank, Cody is feeling optimistic. Seeing today and seeing that the water is up and we actually have flow is amazing. Like right off the bat, I'm super excited about it. By September of 2021, the site was finally filling with water thanks to a strong summer monsoon. But it will take time for the habitat to fully recover. Drought has made conserving Chiricahua leopard frogs a bit more complicated, but the lessons learned will help biologists build a better future for frogs and their aquatic habitats. We're looking at you know, private landowners who have a well and who are interested in providing habitat for Chiricahua leopard frogs. Stock tanks that have a liner where we can ensure some sort of permanency of water on the landscape. Again, so those metapopulations can contract, but we will always have water and frogs, at least at a handful of sites within the meta population. And that's gonna be good for the frog. It's also gonna be good for elk, turkey, bear. Water is good for all wildlife. Connect with us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Follow us at AZGFD. Bouncing around the back country. I enjoy being outside. I enjoy the scenery. It's just fun to get out and ride. It's an exciting way to explore Arizona. All the different terrains that Arizona has, it's not just desert. The adventure shifts your senses into overdrive. 
It can be as thrilling as a roller coaster. You never know what you're going to see or what you're going to come across. Or as relentlessly relaxing as a Sunday drive. Beautiful, exhilarating, peaceful. It sure uh, tickles my uh, soul to do things like this, you know. Welcome to the Arizona Peace Trail. What's exciting to me for the Arizona Peace Trail is number one, the amount of miles that it covers. It's a 675 mile loop in Western Arizona that runs through three Arizona counties, Yuma, La Paz, and Mojave. This trail uh, takes you into a lot of the back country in, in Western Arizona. It also takes you to all the small communities between Bullhead and Kingman and uh, Yuma. This has brought a whole sector of tourism back to these communities and they're beginning to grow. Matter of fact, Wikiup has, has actually expanded their little hotel from three rooms to five rooms. This is our third winter that we started doing this. We just came over the mountain to go down to Wikiup for some breakfast and... Brian and Andy came from Michigan to spend a couple of months and some money in Arizona. Yeah, we're gonna take some of the Peace Trail. There's a spot we like to go to. When we heard about the Arizona Peace Trail, we decided we wanted to do it. So we've been asking friends for quite some time if anybody wants to go with us, and all of our friends decided they wanted to go. So. Louise and her oh, friends yeah. left their homes in Lake Havasu <laughs> City to spend a week on the trail. Are y'all having a good time? Yeah. yeah. Very good time. Yeah. We leave here, um, Salome, in the morning, and we go to Yuma and then the following night we'll be in Quartzsite, and then we go back on Friday to Lake Havasu. So that'll be six days on the trail. The Arizona Peace Trail gets its name from La Paz County. La Paz is Spanish for the peace. Okay, I guess we're yeah. ready to go, right? Yeah. The trail got its start after various plans had been introduced to create OHV routes in different parts of the region. Radio check. OHV enthusiasts suggested combining those ideas into a single project on a much grander scale. To move the plan forward, members of about 14 OHV clubs formed Arizona Peace Trail Incorporated. It's a nonprofit corporation we established in 2015 just for the purpose of, of supporting BLM Game and Fish to get this completed. J.C. Sanders was its first chairman. He's a snowbird from Kentucky with a winter home in Bouse. The first big milestone was just to identify a potential route, and that took us about a year and a half working with the different clubs and, and trying different routes and coming up with something that was feasible. You know, the work that's been put in is countless countless volunteer hours. They are the boots on the ground, riding the trails, seeing which ones work, which ones will not. Building a trail was never an option. The project uses the vast network of trails and roads that already existed. We're using a lot of mining trails. We're using some county roads, everything from graded roads to moderately difficult trails. With a grant from Arizona State Parks, the Peace Trail Committee developed a master plan. It's been working with private landowners and government agencies to secure rights of way ever since. There's been a lot of challenges. It's been a lot of fun though, because you get to meet so many people solving the problems. There's been an abundance of support from the BLM, State Parks, State Land Department, Arizona Game and Fish, and officials at all levels of government. I think the first milestone I, that, that I'm very proud of is, is the sign right here, the Arizona Peace Trail sign. This happens to be the first one that, that was actually installed in La Paz County. As an off-road enthusiast and La Paz County supervisor, Holly Irwin has supported the trail from the start. I could see the definite benefit that it would bring to the restaurants, the hotels, the gas stations. Um, you know, bringing, bringing the monies into these little areas is, was so important, so it, it wasn't hard to jump on board. Now she's doing more of the heavy lifting after becoming chair of the Arizona Peace Trail Committee in January of 2021. You know, there's a lot of work to do, but I, I get phone calls probably every other day from people reaching out wanting more information on the Arizona Peace Trail, and they're coming from all over the country. So, um, you know, the buzz is out there. The Peace Trail has definitely become a point of pride for Western Arizona.
it's 675 miles, and by the time you go into the little towns to get fuel and food and lodging, it usually ends up around 700, between 700 and 725, and it takes me six days to ride it because I stay in hotels. Camping, the ideal trip would probably be two weeks, and, and just take your time. There's so much to see. The idea for the trail came from the community, came from the off-roaders. Initially, it was for them all about access. They wanted to ensure that they had access for the future. Uh, but over time, that evolved into wanting to make sure that people were out here doing the right thing, that they were recreating responsibly and safely. The club's main goal and the Peace Trail's main goal is to maintain the trails or stay on the trails. Don't tear them up. If we start tearing trails up, tearing the side of the desert up, going everywhere where there's no trails, eventually we're gonna get shut out. We're not gonna have this to do. So much has been accomplished, but as of 2021, the trail remains a work in progress. I'm really excited for the future. I'm looking forward to us getting the, the real estate issues behind us. We're still in the process of um, getting it established to the point that we can apply for national trail status. In the meantime, the best place to start planning a trip on the Arizona Peace Trail is online at arizonapeacetrail.org. It's fun to do. Absolutely beautiful. It's just a real adventure to complete the entire loop. The condors are an endangered species, and what's cool here is that we have a chance to get up close and personal to them and see them in a completely wild and free setting. Um, we're on the, the Navajo Bridge, and the condors, they like to roost and nest on the superstructure of the bridge, on the footings and things in the evenings, and so they're here in the morning. It's like we are right now, they're flying around and showing off to people. So you're up close and personal watching them do what they want to do. Just seeing them do condor things you know, and uh, uh, things you don't get to see in a zoo uh, or in another place like that where you could get this close to them. And they are uh, nine and a half feet wingspan and they weigh up to 26 pounds. So it's like a huge Thanksgiving turkey flying around at you. Uh, it's, they're incredible birds. Jennifer Pressler walks a lot. She's a non-game birds and mammal specialist. And today, it's a beautiful day to catch prairie dogs. So we're at the La Cienegas National Conservation Area. This is the first area in the state that we've reintroduced black-tailed prairie dogs. Right now we're setting traps or so waiting for the prairie dogs to go into the traps so we can assess their, their health and their uh, reproductive status. As cute as they are, prairie dogs were once considered a big threat to livestock. Many ranchers saw the critters as a pest, competing with cows for forage and tearing up the landscape. They were virtually eradicated in early 20th century extermination campaigns. Then, people began to see what happened when the prairie dog was taken out. Arizona Game and Fish decided that it was really important to reintroduce black-tailed prairie dogs back to the landscape. They're a keystone species, which means that um, on the landscape, they really make a difference for a lot of other animals. Their burrow systems can be homes to other animals, as well as the way that their burrows work. It helps aerate the soil and helps you know, increase the di diversity of grasses in the grasslands. Also, without prairie dogs here, um, the mesquite seems to take over a little bit. Um, but if we've noticed, since prairie dogs have been back, that if uh, mesquite starts growing up on the colonies, the prairie dogs are usually pretty quick to, to clip that, and so it helps keep the grasslands, you know, in their, in their more natural state. There has been some, you know, different opinions on whether or not prairie dogs can be good for ranches or not, but we have a great partnership here with Empire Ranch at Las Cienegas, and uh, the cows seem to love it. They, uh, they often preferentially choose to graze on the prairie dog colonies. Um, they don't seem to have any issues with it, so yeah, so far it seems like it's been a beneficial relationship. 
about a week ago, we set the traps out. Each one is marked. They've got numbered flags, so we keep track of where the traps are and how many are out at each site. When we set those traps, we locked the traps open. We clipped them open on both sides so that prairie dogs would be able to come in and out freely without getting trapped and added bait to the traps. So they get used to the traps being there and they get used to you know, being rewarded by going into the traps. When they walk in, they'll be, the doors will close behind them and uh, hopefully we'll be able to start trapping prairie dogs pretty soon here this morning. When we trap them, we um, take them back to a processing site that's right nearby. We'll take them out of the traps, handle them in processing bags. And from there, each one should have an individual tag marking on it. It's a pit tag, so it's kind of like a microchip they would use on a dog or a cat. So we'll be able to scan and see which individual each of the prairie dogs are. Usually they're about 150, but... In addition to that, we'll also just check their general health. A little bit in the trap. So we'll look for any parasites. We will do some measurements, get body condition, um, and then in the spring we'll also be looking at reproductive status to see, see what's, what number of pups we can start to expect. After their checkup, the prairie dogs are marked for future identification purposes and then taken back to their burrows. The prairie dogs, they have you know, more complex language than, than most people could imagine. Um, so they've, they've got very complex social structures um, and definitely different warning sounds for different predators and, and all sorts of things. The main takeaway that I would like people to have from this project um, is that Game and Fish is out here trying to you know, conserve all species. We're working with these black-tailed prairie dogs. We're just trying to help the landscape, help recreate the grasslands as they once were, um, and just try to help the help the animals and help the ecosystem as much as we can. If you've ever tired of the washed out, faded colors of a desert summer, you will find a bounty of electric hues in the trees, plants, and birds of the Boyce Thompson Arboretum. An hour east of Phoenix on Highway 60, Boyce Thompson is an affirmation that in the middle of a desert, you can find as many colors as you would in a Crayola box. And we're not just talking about the plants. You can come here fall, winter, spring, summer, and you're going to see bird species. We happen to have a lot of shade here too, so it's a lot cooler here at Boyce Thompson during the summer than it is in the, down in the valley. So it's a perfect place to come and bird. We've got birds here that like riparian habitat. We've got Queen Creek running through here. We've got a pond. We also have the Arizona uplands, uh, the Sonoran Desert. So we've got trees, we've got mesquite, we've got acacia, and we have our, you know, our very own eucalyptus forest as well. So um, between, among all of these different ecosystems that we have here, there's plenty, many, many birds. A lot of the focus is on desert species, which are kind of concentrated here, because if you look at us from above, we're kind of an oasis, so we attract everything from the surrounding areas, so all the natives, and then also some vagrants from Mexico, so a lot of South American and Mexican birds end up here. We're kind of a hot spot in terms of birds from all directions. Just wonderful, anytime you're out, you have that opportunity, you can look up in the sky and see hawks flying over. You can see small birds running on the ground and cardinals singing in the trees. So I think at any time, any place, there's always birds. It just appeals to everybody. It gets you out in nature. And at least in a wonderful state like Arizona, we can get out 365, always have wonderful weather. You see a lot of people. And it's just, it doesn't cut, it cuts across everything. So you can be female, male, young, old, or whatever you want to do. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for everybody. The Arboretum is, of course, world-renowned for the way it brings together plants from the planet's many varied deserts. It features 3,900 different species of plants and three miles of walking trails. 
In the spring, you'll find vibrant, exotic, and native cacti with some of the most beautiful blooms in the world. And if you miss the seasons, go in the fall when the trees turn colors that can sometimes rival anything back east. Whether you're visiting the Arboretum to see the birds, or if you're coming to take in its amazing collection of plants, Executive Director Lynn Namath believes it's all connected. Once you even start just looking for birds, you start to pay more attention to the natural environment. You start to pay more attention to plants. So uh, I think that I know that I started out being an animal person and a amateur birder, and now I'm a plant person, and I think it's all linked. So I think it's a great way to get people involved in the natural world. That's going to do it for this edition of our show. Until next time, get out there and enjoy these Arizona wildlife views. To subscribe to Arizona Wildlife Views magazine, which includes the Arizona Wildlife Views calendar, visit www.azgfd.gov magazine.